your book, uh, you've mentioned how you transformed uh, your family business uh, into the consumer uh, FMCG goods giant Mariko. And today Mariko is a name that is a part of every NRI household. Uh, and it sells in across 25 countries in Asia and Africa. So tell us all about your journey in launching and forming Mariko. So Mariko was formed in the year 1990. And prior to that, I was a part of a family managed uh, organization which involved uh, my father, my uncles, and some of my cousins also. And it had different businesses in Bombay Oil Industries. Uh, amongst other businesses, we also had a chemical business, we had a spice extracts business. And these businesses didn't have any synergies amongst themselves. So they were standalone businesses without any synergy. Uh, and independently, I mean, it required different skills for each business to succeed. And there were many family members in, in the company. So it was uh, difficult for me to build a consumer product business in a diversified uh, company, which had multiple family members which was located in the heart of commodity markets in, in Bombay. I was not able to attract talent. Uh, there was uh, not clear allocation of capital amongst different businesses. And um, there were other issues in terms of, you know, so many family members in, in the same company. So in a way it was like uh, limiting for me in terms of aspirations, in terms of freedom, in terms of growth. And I took some time to convince the family. It took almost two to three years for me to convince the family to allow me to take uh, the consumer product business, which I had built up from, uh, from a completely family dominated company to an independent company where I was the only family member who was involved. It was a management separation. It was not a financial separation. So the financial interest remained same uh, in the earlier company and in Maric also, which meant that uh, the financials were shared amongst all the brothers of the elder generation, that is my father and three of his brothers. Okay, if, if you want to talk more about Mariko's uh, retail expansion, if you could shed some light on that. So formation of Mariko gave me a great opportunity to, to improve on many, many things. And the first step I took was to uh, recruit very good talent because I needed to have good talent in an FMCG business. You need very good talent because you're competing, competing in the marketplace. So I had to attract talent from other FMCG companies and multinationals, the Indian FMCG companies. So I think that was my first task after formation of Marico. And then very quickly I realized that talent by itself is not enough. You need to create a culture within the organization where the talent can flourish. Because I recruited uh, many managers, senior managers, within a very short period of time, coming from different backgrounds. And the fact that they all assembled together under one company, Marico, uh, they were they're not, I and mean, each one came from their own set of beliefs in terms of how to manage people, products, profits. So that's how I realized that we needed to create a strong culture. And I spent two to three years in terms of culture building for the organization. And then once all that was done, then we said that we need now to expand, expand both distribution as well as expand our range of products. Because at that time we just had two brands, Parachute and Sapona. So we, we, we wanted to grow beyond Parachute and Sapona and we identified beauty and wellness as a space to grow. And in that, we believed that we could do it organically by launching our own brands and inorganically also by acquiring other brands from other companies. So your so brand, we were, okay, sorry to cut you, but sorry, uh, I just wanted to check, uh, uh, talking about your brands, of course, besides India, your brands have a big name in the NRI household. Would you like to talk yes. more about that? Yes, so, until 1990, exports of coconut oil were banned. And though there was demand for parachute in uh, Middle East countries where a lot of Indians had settled, and in other markets like USA and wherever Indians had settled, 
um, but you are not allowed to export. And we knew that uh, parachute was being smuggled uh, to the Middle East markets. Uh, so it was available in limited uh, quantities through smuggling route. So when the Indian economy started liberalizing in the early 90s, I, uh, we applied to the government to allow us to export coconut oil in small packs. And initially they allowed us to export it by giving us a license. But over a period of time, they allowed free the exports. I think that gave us a great uh, platform to expand in international markets. So from 91 onwards, we started growing in international markets. And our first focus was the Middle East markets, which includes all the Middle Eastern countries, starting from UAE to Saudi, to Oman, to, to Kuwait, to, to Bahrain, every, every country except Egypt. And so I think that's how we started entering. And we created an office, we set up an office in Dubai. And I think that's how our journey has begun in, in, um, in launching our products in, the, in those markets. And over a period of time, then we also acquired two brands in Egypt. So now we are also in all the GCC countries, including Egypt. Talking about Middle East and Dubai, as you mentioned, uh, uh, what are your comments on uh, UAE's retail sector? Uh, especially since you've expanded so much across the Middle East? So the UAE retail sector is, uh, has changed quite a lot in the last, uh, from the time we started exporting in the 90s to today. It's almost like uh, 30, 30 years now. And I think we are seeing emergence of the modern uh, retail chains like R4 and others. They, they were not there at that time. So I think a lot of modernization has taken place, especially in, in UAE, Dubai, more developed uh, economies within the GCC countries. And I think so the distribution, which was mainly through a small retail shop, has changed dramatically over a period of time. And a lot of our sales now come out of the, out of the modern retail trade. Chains like Carrefour and you know many other, some of the Indian chains also which have come in now. Okay. So that is shift, I would say, over a period of time. And also with a lot, lot more, um, shall I say, more international um, tourists coming to India, international people settling down in Dubai, tourists coming to Dubai, international, um, international settled down. So I think it's become far more, shall I say, cosmopolitan, the market. And we also, earlier, we were only selling uh, products to mainly to Indians, but now it goes to apart from Indians to other Asians like Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, uh, Sri Lankans. And then uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, lots uh, some products for the Arab community. And some of it is also used by the international uh, uh, from other uh, countries. You know. uh, talking also about, uh, your, about Kaya, uh, you also launched Kaya Limited. Uh, which runs a chain of skin care clinics across India and the Middle East. Uh, could you tell yes. us more about it? So Kaya began operations, I think in the Middle East around 2005 or so, or 2007, I'm not 100%, maybe 2007. And um, I think we started in Dubai and now we are present in, uh, we have about 23 clinics in UAE, in Oman, in Saudi. Um, and um, we have, in, in Dubai, we have now um, gone for a new identity, Kaya Clinics, uh, and which is very, very modern and which, is, uh, which has the very latest kind of a, uh, interiors, uh, very cheap. So I think our presence mainly in Middle East is through Maricorut and through the Kaya Clinics. So, and do you think uh, uh, the Kaya Clinic uh, would help expand the beauty retail chain across the Middle East and everywhere else? Yes, because uh, you know there is increasing realization that beauty is uh, people want to look better, and we go on um, launching newer initiatives um, to improve the overall offerings in the area of beauty. So clearly we are one of the largest chains in the, in the Middle East. And uh, it basically catered to a 
demand which uh, wants to uh, use latest scientific uh, technology, uh, dermatology to improve their skin, to improve their hair. And now in, in Kaya and Middle East, we also have gone in for, for improving the overall body contouring, you know. So we've gone in for uh, what we call cool sculpt. And so that's another service we started, at least in, in Dubai for the timing, and we are going to roll it out all over the GCC countries. Adding to your, I'm adding a question since you mentioned all about innovation uh, uh, yes. used in beauty. Uh, so how do you think yeah. innovation and, and technology can help the beauty retail industry scale up? So it's very important to innovate because consumer is expecting better and better uh, offerings. And in a highly competitive environment, it's a matter of time others copy you. So you have to be two or three steps ahead of competition. And the only way to remain ahead of competition is to constantly innovate. So whether you are doing a new product or a new service, you have to constantly look out for opportunities to innovate. And uh, I think the technology also is progressing quite fast. So there are opportunities to innovate by leveraging technology. I would say that uh, innovation is very, very crucial if you have to maintain an edge uh, because the consumer also wants something later, something far more effective, something better, something differentiated. So we have to be constantly on the lookout for innovative options. Okay, so my concluding question to you is as an entrepreneur, uh, what, how do you think entrepreneurship can play a big role in solving some of the most pressing retail challenges across the world? So I strongly believe that entrepreneurs add a lot of value to all the stakeholders. First of all, to themselves in terms of running a business and creating wealth, but more importantly, adding value to other stakeholders. So they employ a lot of people, so you know they, they benefit uh, those whom they employ and add value to them and not just giving them a job, but give them experience, give them learning, give them a purpose in life. Uh, they add value to customers if, because you're not just selling a product or a service. You are doing much more than that, you know. You are selling a lifestyle in case of Kaya. You're selling, in case of Safala, you're selling healthcare. So it's very important that uh, organizations look at what they are selling it to customers and go beyond just selling what they're offering. So they add value to customers, they add value to the society by giving something back to the society in terms of taxes, CSR work. So it's very important that uh, you know, we go on expecting the government to drive the economic growth in any country. But I think the major role has to be played by the entrepreneurs. Because if they identify newer uh, opportunities, newer innovations, then automatically growth in that country uh, would improve. But and for me, and I want to talk a little bit about the book. Uh, which, yes, uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you want to talk, shed some yeah. more light on the book and your experience yeah. at the Sharjah Book Fair. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, the book has got uh, very good reviews in India. It's already a bestseller. And my personal um, uh, view is that the book is relevant for any reader. Initially, I thought the book would be targeted towards entrepreneurs and professionals. But when I started giving the book to students, when I started giving the book to some of my friends who were not in business or their spouses, they all felt that the book had something to offer. It's a very easy to read story format with a lot of take home values. And one thing I have, uh, I mean, after getting a lot of feedback, uh, those who have read the book, they have said that you learned something from the book and there is some take home value which we can apply to our lives. So I am almost taking a bet that any person who reads the book uh, and if that person doesn't uh, get some take home value, I am willing to give the refund of the cost of the book. I am that confident now because it has got very good reviews and it is very easy reading. It is very interesting. The whole objective of writing my book was not to sell the book but to actually impart the learning from my own journey. And if I can do that to more and more people, then I feel much more happier because I would have made that difference to their lives by through my own 